No one would know it was you. Go ahead, swear. Go ahead. Just say, hey, you son of a... All right. You guys got that deer in the headlights look. I know. We have four more classes. The last class is going to be a review. Say yes. It'll be a major kahoot. You got me? And uh, the person who wins it, um, if they're taking the um, oral final, then um, they can pick one of their questions. So they only have two that they can fail. <laughs> okay, here we go. That's your skin. What's underneath your skin? Yeah, that's a blood vessel. You got me? Who's with me so far? Okay, as we learned when we talked about inflammation, we learned that arterial blood, yes, it flows in a laminar fashion, right? We learned that the watery part of blood, the plasma, flows on the edges, and the formed elements of the blood flow in the middle. You got me? So you remember this. One of the formed elements that flow in the middle are these little things called platelets. And platelets, when they're not activated, are round. Tell me you got that. Now watch. An intact blood vessel doesn't bleed. <sighs> Do you want me to repeat that? Yes. Okay. But if somebody takes a broken broomstick and stabs it into you and then pulls it out, you have unintacted the blood vessel. Say yes. You've damaged the blood vessel. You got me? So within the wall of the blood vessel, when a blood vessel is damaged, it exposes a chemical called tissue factor. Tissue factor is actually an enzyme. And what tissue factor will do is it will begin to initiate the inactive clotting factors into active clotting factors. Are you following me so far? Now, platelets are the first things that begin to form a clot. But when they're in their round state, they will not form a clot. This is important. But watch. As the blood starts leaking out of the vessel, spurtulating out. You with me? Platelets will come in contact with that tissue factor. And when platelets come in contact with that tissue factor, they get turned on. And little round plates turn into stars. Ah. Oh. And they're on American Idol. And what will happen is those little round platelets, when they're turned into stars, and why did they get turned into stars? Because they, 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 because they came in contact with tissue factor, right? So what's going to happen is those platelets are leaving because your blood is spurtulating out of that hole. They're going to come in contact with tissue factor. And those round platelets will begin to form stars, and the little edges of the stars will stick together and form a platelet plug. So the first thing that has to happen to begin to form a clot is these little round platelets come in contact with tissue factor, they get turned on, form stars, the little ends of the stars stick together and form the platelet plug. Who's with me? When that platelet plug is formed, it will begin to release additional tissue factor. What does tissue factor do? 
it activates the enzymes of the clotting cascade. Who's following me so far? And ladies and gentlemen, this is the clotting cascade. Oh, <laughs> yeah, all right. How many people have now gotten on their phone and looked up the courses for horticulture? <laughs> okay, watch. I'm not expecting you to know all this. I'm not expecting you to know all this. But there's, there's important parts in the clotting cascade that you need to understand. All right? Now watch. There are really three branches, three arms to the clotting cascade. You got the intrinsic pathway. You have the extrinsic pathway. And then you have the common pathway. All right? So I'm going to simplify this for you. I, I, I'm going to do my very best. Look. When you're bleeding your own blood, you want to stop that bleeding. You got me? So when you damage a blood vessel, right, in either case, and this is important to remember, both pathways are activated at the same time. But the most important part of this pathway is the final step. What you want to do is you want to convert what's called fibrinogen into fibrin. Tell me you got that. Now, watch. Do you remember, uh, do you ever get into those, uh, those uh, pyramid schemes? You know, with money? You know, like here, I'll give everybody, you know what I mean? Yeah. So the more people you get involved, at the end, the more money you make. Do you follow? Now look, here, in the intrinsic pathway, there are more steps to it. So you activate enzymes, and this is the important thing. Once you come in contact where you activate factor 12 into the active factor 12, are you with me? This one factor 12 will then, it's an enzyme, will activate 100 factor 11s. And then the 100 factor 11s will activate 1,000 factor 9s. Do you understand this? So this is like the avalanche effect, where you kick a pebble off a mountain, and all of a sudden you're, you're killing people and crushing trucks at the bottom of the road. <laughs> Who, who's following this? So here's the important thing. In the extrinsic pathway, the number of steps, or the number of enzymes that you activate, to activate the inactive fibrinogen and the fibrin are much fewer. So the amount of fibrin that you make is less, but it's quicker. So the extrinsic pathway for clotting forms a clot quicker, but it's an unstable clot. The intrinsic pathway forms a stable clot, but it takes longer. So the reason you have two clotting pathways is so you don't bleed to death while the intrinsic pathway is trying to make a stable clot. Do you follow that? Y yes or no? Yes. Now watch. Do people ever like patch like a gene? No, they cut holes in their genes. I can't even use it. Back in the day, right, if you had a hole in your shirt, your mom would patch it, right? So if you have a hole in your blood vessel, you'd have mom patch it. How you patch it is this. Fibrinogen, as the name implies, fibrin are fibers. So what they do is when fibrinogen is turned into the active fibrin, it forms a fibrin net. And what does this net do? It catches red blood cells. Tell me you got that. So if you've ever had a clot, like a really good cut, 
You ever have a really good, like a gaping wound? Mm -hmm. What will happen is once you put some pressure on it, right, you're going to form that kind of jelly clot. You know what I'm talking about, right? That's the effects of the extrinsic pathway. That's not a stable clot. But over the, next, the course of the next several days, you're going to add more fibrin to that, and it's going to become a much more stable clot. Say yes. What's that? You when you get a tooth pulled, right? Yeah, don't mess with that clot. That's the extrinsic pathway, forming that little glob in there. Do they ever say that to you? Well, they will now. Yeah. You ever just feel like just sucking that clot right out of there? <laughs> okay. This is what I want you to understand. What? Look. This is how you're gonna st you're gonna start out your answer. All clotting factors are enzymes, and the ultimate goal of initiating the clotting factors are to turn the inactive fibrinogen into fibrin so you can test those red blood cells and form a clot, say yes. You're going to tell me about the ex extrinsic pathway or forms a clot quicker, but it's unstable. And the intrinsic pathway forms a much more stable clot so you don't bleed, bleed to death, but it takes longer because you have to activate more steps. But both steps are activated at the same time. Say yes. And again, all of these are enzymes. Who's with me? Okay. This is the clinical piece that I want you to understand. If you go to graduate school, they'll expect you to know all these and all the things that inhibit it. This is, you know, a two-year degree. It's a 100-level class. I'm not expecting the world. Who's following me so far? So watch. Are there times when you want your blood to clot slower? Yeah. When are those times? Childhood. What? What's that? Childhood. No, you want to bleed. You want to clot. Clot too fast and excess amount of blood. What? No, you. What? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I I don't know. Like when you pop out a fetus, you want to stop bleeding, right? Yeah, yeah but it happens. So I, oh, like I mean, it doesn't happen right away. And it doesn't clot right away. It doesn't? Yeah. <laughs> That's messy. That. I don't know anything about that. I don't know anything about kids and birth. <laughs> the only thing I know about kids is making them <laughs> most DVT right deep vein thrombosis right how about uh, how about this one atrial fib hi I'm Arnold Palmer and I got atrial fib and when I ain't sucking down you know Arnold Palmer juice <laughs> I worry about getting an atrial fib that's why I take Eliquist you ever see those commercials never watch them Vicky's just shaking her head. you never seen that commercial. You know what? I'm going to make you watch it for extra credit. Um, how about this? People who are at risk for uh, stroke say, yeah, right? Have you ever heard of, uh, like, atrial fib? You've heard of the um, atrial appendages? They're little sacs off the atria that looks like dog ears, right? And when those atria don't contract, they don't squish the blood out of the appendages so that blood can clot. And that clot can break loose and form a stroke if it's on the left side or a pulmonary embolus if it's on the right. You notice how I related questions from the cardiovascular quiz on that? You know, that's, that's good teaching. God. If I could make this all one video, I would. Like the rest of, no, the rest of this class on one video. I'm going to go home and make it. All right, um, <laughs> watch. When people come out of surgery, do they like getting, a, getting up and popping a lock? No. Yes. no. So they, their blood has to be loaded with some anticoagulants so that they don't get DVTs and pop up a, a PE. Say yes. So 
what I'm going to explain to you is how medicines like heparin and Coumadin work. Are you ready? Wait, what were they? And I think that's on the final. There, yeah, you guys said it. Th number 34. <laughs> I'm pulling up tonight, and I'm like, I can't make this class any easier. No. It's right here for you. Joe, am I right? Right. What could you complain about? Besides, I'm a wise ass. And Gina Haywood, the provost, knows I'm a wise ass. She knows it. She goes, Tim, you're a wise ass. I go, yes. She said that to me in my interview. <laughs> Here we go. Ready? So watch. What don't people get to do right after surgery? Papa, okay, what else don't they get to do? What else? Move. What else? Eat. Eat. They don't get to eat. The only time they get to eat, that's why as a nurse, surgical patient, you listen to their bowel sounds. And they say, hey, are you farting at all? No. Then they listen. If they don't hear anything, their GI tract is anesthetized. That's what general anesthesia does. It generally anesthetizes everything. Say yes. So if your GI tract ain't moving, then your body does stuff that makes sense. And what it will do is if you eat anything, you will ralph it up. Say yeah. So you can't give them an anticoagulant orally, so you have to administer it parenterally around the GI tract. Say yes. And the most common way to administer an anticoagulant following surgery is subcutaneously with the use of heparin or Lovenox or Eliquist. Say yes, Equist. Yes, Equist. Good. <laughs> so watch. In the clotting cascade, heparin inhibits an enzyme. I'm, I'm sorry. It inhibits it. Wait. <laughs> Write this down. It stimulates an enzyme called antithrombin. What does antithrombin do? It prevents prothrombin from being converted to the active enzyme thrombin. And what does thrombin do? It converts the inactive fibrinogen into the active fibrin. So with prothrombin inactivated, say yes, it will take longer for you to convert fibrinogen into fibrin. So what will happen to how long it takes you to clot your blood? It will take longer for that blood to clot because you're not making thrombin and convert and that thrombin converts fibrinogen into fibrin and fibrin forms the clot. <laughs> Did you get that? Yeah. Okay. Yes or no? What do you mean no? I explained that good. Watch. All these steps form a clot. Do you understand? All these steps form a clot. If you inhibit a step, it will take longer to form a clot. You are preventing prothrombin from being converted to thrombin. That means it'll take longer for that blood to clot. But it's still possible to clot? Uh, yeah, you, you better it. hope, yeah. They don't inactivate all of it, right? Because if you, it's dose dependent. And if you do, then you don't clot. And then you turn into one giant hematoma. Big bruise. So what is the name of the enzyme that's being stimulated? Antithrombin. So antithrombin prevents, that's why there's an X there. Yeah, I just, I just <coughs> get it. Now I got it. I just Say yes. You're following this. Yeah. You better write this down. The blood test that they use to determine the effectiveness of heparin and 
heparin-like substances like Aliquis or Lovinox. It's called the... I can't even spell it. Partial... Thromboplastin. Time. Or P-T-T. Have you ever heard of PTT? You've never heard of PTT? No. How many people have never heard of it? Have you heard of it? Sarah, have you heard of it? Now you know what it's for. It's nope, it tests for the effectiveness of heparin. Tell me you got that. I'm making this up. I'm making it up. I'm making it up. Who cares if I'm making it up? The normal PTT time for someone who is not on an anticoagulant is 15 seconds. Do you want the PTT of somebody who is on heparin to be less than 15 seconds or more? You want it to be more. Say yes. That means it takes longer to clot. So a person who's on heparin may have a PTT of 30 seconds. And doctors want to know that because that will determine whether or not they're properly anticoagulated. Are you following me? Now, why isn't heparin given IM? Yeah, why isn't it given into the muscle? Do muscles have a blood supply? This is a laser for real. Yeah, uh, you ever bite into a raw steak? Yes. It's yeah. bloody! So what does heparin do? It makes your blood not clot. So watch! If you stick it into a muscle that has a huge blood supply, it will keep bleeding because you're damaging tissue. That's why it's given sub-Q because there's not a lot of blood vessels and fat. Tell me you got that. Plus, heparin's not absorbed well through the GI tract. Are you yep. with me? Now watch. Do people and doctors and nurses, do they trust patients to give themselves the correct dose of heparin sub-Q? Mm -hmm. No. So when they're about to go home, right, a couple of days before they go home, they're started on an oral medicine called Coumadin. Coumadin affects the extrinsic pathway of blood clotting. So yeah, yeah. Better write this down. Better not pout. Pack yourself. Pack yourself. prevents the recycling of vitamin K in your liver. So if you have less vitamin K, you will have less activation of factor 7. If you have less activation of factor 7, you will convert less prothrombin to thrombin. And less thrombin will convert less fibrinogen to fibrin. So what will happen to the amount of time it takes your blood to clot? Longer. Watch. That's why I'm the commercials. Hi, I'm Joey Bag of Donuts. Right? I used to be on Coumadin, but it sucked because I had to watch everything I ate and I had to go to the doctor every two seconds to check my pro time, my pro thrombin time. Right? So watch. Coumadin only affects the vitamin K that's stored in your liver. It doesn't affect the vitamin K 
that you eat in your diet. So if you eat a lot of vitamin K, green leafy vegetables, and who don't like green leafy vegetables, right? I see a green leafy vegetable on the side of the road, I stop and I eat it. Those have vitamin K, so if you take that in your diet, that will activate factor seven and make the blood clot. That's why people on Coumadin they have to have their blood check all the time because diet can interfere with it. Say yes. So write this down. And you will see, if you work on a med surge floor, you will see this all the time. How do they do that? PT. I think it's like this. And then they have like INR. You ever see that? Where they do that? All right, fine. I don't know. I just saw it. <laughs> Watch. Listen up, because this is true. It takes about two to three days of Coumadin dosing to start producing an anticoagulant effect. That's why people in the hospital, they are given heparin and Coumadin at the same time. That's why in morning labs, post-surgical patients, you will see blood work that will contain both a PTT that looks at the effects of heparin and a PT. PTT stands for partial thromboplastin time. I will tell you this. I don't know what that is. I looked that up. I studied it. I still don't understand it. And if anyone wants to look at it and study it and can explain it in a way I understand it, I'll give you extra credit. PT stands for pro time or prothrombin time. You got me? It's not a clotting factor. What it's looking at is how long does it take, right, the inactive prothrombin to be converted to the active enzyme thrombin. So, but in this class, you can look at it as a clotting time, right? I mean, the result is basically the same. Now, one of the things that you'll see a lot, and it only refers to pro time, is you will also see INR. Have you ever seen that, right? Does anyone know what that means? No? Okay, watch. Do you have to have your pro time check frequently if you're on Coumadin? Yes. What if you decide to go on a big vacation? Let's say to Waukegan or Zion, right? Watch. Do the hospitals in Waukegan use the same pro time kit in their laboratory as the hospitals in Milwaukee and Racine? Do they? Probably not. So what a doctor wants to know is, is this pro time that I'm getting, right, is this an indication of their true pro time, or is it different because they're using a different kit? So what they came up with was the INR, and the INR stands for the International Normalization Ratio. I will give anyone... <coughs> I will write you out a check for one million dollars if this doesn't come back and bite you on the fatty acid. Yeah, I well, that's why I'm not writing out a check. I'm going to explain it to you. International normalization ratio. So what they do is they take the patient's measured pro time. divided by the pro time of the kit that they're using to measure the pro time. So there's always a kit control. A 
That sounds like a TV star. <laughs> Kit Control and Efren Zimblis Jr. in Don't Let Your Blood Clot. Ready? So watch. Do you want the patient's pro time to be higher than the pro time kick control? Do you want it to take longer for the blood to clot? Mm -hmm. Yes. So the pro time of a patient, I'm making this up, is like 30 seconds. And the pro time of the kick control is 15 seconds. So what's the INR? Do the math. If you want, you can use a calculator. <laughs> Their I and R will be reported as two. You got me? So what doctors really look at is their I and R. And based on why they're receiving anticoagulant therapy, and if you're on Coumadin, that means you're on long-term, right, anticoagulant therapy. If it's for a valve, like if you have an artificial valve, right, then you want an INR of like 2.5, sometimes 3, because you don't want blood clots forming on that artificial valve, because if they break loose, then you get strokes or whatever. Say, so, yeah. If it's a DBT, they usually like it about 1.5 or 2. Tell me you got that. So that's the blood clotting pathway. Now, watch. If you get this, I'm going to be real proud of you. What's the antidote for excessive Coumadin? Vitamin K. Vitamin K. <laughs> oh. Why? Because what does Coumadin do? It inhibits the recycling of vitamin K. So if you give them vitamin K, it will inhibit the effects of Coumadin. Mm -hmm. How many people followed that? Mm -hmm. All right. What's the antidote for heparin overdose? Heparin overdose. Right. It's called uh, protamine sulfate. Right? And basically what protamine sulfate does is binds to the heparin and makes it inactive. I didn't expect you to know that. I expect you to know the vitamin K though. Yeah. So do you want someone in on heparin to have a high vitamin K diet? No, because uh, yeah. heparin only affects the um, extrinsic yeah. pathway by inhibiting the um, antithrombin. See, yeah. Okay, watch. The newer drugs they have out there, you've heard of Lovenox, Eliquist. These work very good. They kind of, they work, they're low molecular weight heparin, so they inhibit prothrombin from being converted to thrombin. So it doesn't affect vitamin K. So people don't have to have their blood checked frequently as long as they know that their bleeding time is stable. The problem is there's no antidote for those. So if they're too high, they bleed to death. Blood just starts spurtulating out of them. Is that why they're not more popular? I mean, I know they're popular for Yes, that, that's why. Because doctors are afraid that if they um, give them too much that they can't. Right. The half-life of those drugs are pretty low. They're like, you know, maybe 7, 10, 12, 14 hours. So if you can keep them from bleeding to death, Yes. So you're going to see them more and more. Coumadin will be um, kind of out of vogue. But right now it's, you know, well tolerated by people. And But people, they, it sucks because now what they did is they, they have to get machines at home where they monitor their pro time at home because it's critical. Just so you know, the Coumadin is also called Warfarin. And Warfarin was developed at my alma mater through a grant from the Wisconsin Alumni Faculty Foundation, Research Foundation, WARF, that's why it's called WARF.
<laughs> I was there when they discovered it, too. And I said, big wow. What do you want from me? What, is that going to be on the test? <laughs> so that's the blood clotting fact. Say, so, yeah. And you probably heard of factor eight. Uh, people who are hemophilic lack factor eight. So they bleed. Sometimes you just see them like in a pile of blood. Absolutely. It's all of them. The most common, like hemophilia, is a genetic um, deal. What about as you get lower? So as right, you get, I have a factor two deficiency, so then it's more just clotting because you're. I'm more prone to clots because of that. How does that make sense? You lack factor two? I don't know. <laughs> could be worse. Yeah, I could have it. <laughs> so I hate me too. Look, I'm erasing all the stuff I wrote. <laughs> Just to kill time. <laughs> Say yeah. Oh, I um, one more thing, just real quick. Oh, and I race it, son of a. Wait, I can go back. Oh, how long will it let me go? Oh, look at this. Where is it? What happened there? Where? Oh, wait, we're almost there. Oh, that's it. Nerds, it nerds. <laughs> <laughs> it uh, hold up. Con. <laughs> plasminogen into the active form called plasmin. This gets a little goofy. All right, just let me look. When you form a clot because you activate these enzymes and it's a cascade, it could go get out of control. And you could form, you could be a big freaking clot in the morning, right? You don't want that. So, at the same time that you are activating the clotting mechanism, you will activate or convert the inactive plasminogen into the active enzyme plasma, which actually breaks down clots. So it's like you're building up and breaking it down, building up, breaking it down. Are, are you following me? So the clot doesn't get out of control. Are there times when you form a clot inside a vessel and you want to break that clot up? Oh. Yeah, right? If you're having a heart attack or a stroke, right? Yeah. You want to get a, give them a clot buster. So what they will do is they will give them a drug that will convert the inactive plasminogen into the active enzyme plasmin, which will dissolve the clot, right? Break it down. It's called tissue plasminogen activator or TPA. Have you ever heard of it? There you go. So it is, it, what it does is it converts the inactive plasminogen into the active enzyme plasmin and it will dissolve the clot. The problem with that is there, because of the cascading effect, it can cause it to go out of control. So when you, if you bleed, you may not stop bleeding. So one of the risks of giving someone tissue plasminogen activator, TPA, is that they can bleed to death. They usually get that in stroke or a uh, heart attack. Yeah. You got to do it very, very quickly. It's got to be done in the ER. Do they get that in the field? Yeah, so, uh, and this has to be done right away. That's why if they know they're coming in and they're having a uh, ST saliva uh, salivation, <laughs> ST elevation, myocardial infarct, then they will get a uh, TPA ready and try to bust up them. Tell me you got that. All right. So, again, I don't want you to know all the clotting factors. Just understand that the, the intrinsic pathway forms a stable clot because there's more enzymes activated. Ex extrinsic, unstable clot, but it's quicker. 
and then how heparin and coumadin work and the like. Say yeah. Okay, that's very good. Okay, did I answer that question? Yes. All right, that's very good. Okay. All right, we're going to go over the nervous system. What? Nobody likes the nervous system. Do you know why? Because it makes them nervous? Yes. I don't care what anyone says. <coughs> I don't care what anyone says. The best one was that creatinine is the gold no, standard. It's not. <laughs> it's <a normal> <coughs> uh, for guys, it should be uh, typically less than two. Yeah, that person's going into renal failure. Say so, yeah. Okay, here we go. What's this? All right, we did blood clotting, muscle contraction. Here we go, nervous system. Okay, hang on. We're going to review this really quick. What I want to do is I want to review some of the anatomy of uh, the central nervous system, okay? Just as a review, is that okay with you? Yes. All right. First of all, What are the three protective layers of the brain and spinal cord? Right, what are they? What are the three layers? Go ahead, just read it. <laughs> right? There you go. So it's the pia mater, that's the thin, and pia means, uh, armada means mata, mater, means mother, right? So pia means delicate mother. Arachnoid mater means mother. Right. <laughs> Arachnoid, um, I'll explain, and dura tough, durable, dura thick. Yeah, it's like a big babushka lady. All right. Yeah, and she drinks a swig of whiskey in the morning, and then she goes out in the garden and pulls up carrots. All day and makes a big stew. <laughs> My buddy is Yugoslavian, right? My buddy is Yugoslavian, right? So, you ever hear of Schlebovitz? Schleb, Schleb? It's plum brandy. I smell that stuff, and I got home and I looked in the mirror, and my nose hairs were actually curled. <laughs> That stuff is like, it's ridiculous how nasty it is. So anyways, we would play baseball and we'd get up early and we'd take like batting practice and stuff before we'd have to go to work, so like five o'clock. So I'm sitting in the kitchen and she, his grandma wakes up, right? And she's like this classic Eastern European grandma. She's like, you know, about as wide as she is tall. She gets up and she's in her little smock, right? And then she grabs the schlib, right? She pours herself a shot, right? Drinks it and she goes, <laughs> I'll never forget that. And those people, every morning, they will take a shot. Yeah, it just, like, yeah, and she was like 90 years old, and sh she passed away, you know? Right. So, yeah, right. That's what we're going to do before the final. Everybody take a shot. <laughs> Bring your own booze. <laughs> Ready? So uh, the protective layer, say yeah. Pia, suspended above the pia by what appear to be like these little protein girders and they resemble a spider's web is the arachnoid mater. And below the arachnoid mater is the subarachnoid space. And that's where cerebral spinal fluid circulates, right? Then you have lining the skull and spinal column, you have the thick, tough layer called the dura mater. Okay, here we, you better get this right. When people get an epidural, that medicine is injected into the cerebral spinal fluid. Yes? Sure. Yeah. Yes. How many people here have had medical terminology? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's clear you guys did a lot, learned a lot. Watch. <sighs> 
Are there blood vessels surrounding the tissue that make up that um, are outside of the meninges, the dura? Is there? Are there tissue and blood vessels surrounding that? Just say yes. Good. Well, this appears to be a sliced banana <laughs> and maybe some trail mix cereal mixed in there, huh? Okay, watch. Here's the dura right here. Look, here's the dura mater. What does epi mean? Outside or above. So when they do an epidural, they put the medicine into the epidural space, which is outside of the cerebral spinal fluid. Say yes. Now, some teachers are better than others, and I hope that one day you have one. <laughs> and some anesthesiologists are better than others. So when they stick that giant spinal needle in there, sometimes they can rupture the dura and go through the arachnoid mater, and they can actually get into the subarachnoid space. Tell me you got that. They may not know it at the time, <coughs> so as they're administering your little epidural, you're like, hey, I'm fine, I don't feel nothing. But then they pulled it out, <coughs> and they made a hole there, and cerebral spinal fluid starts leaking out. And that supports your brain and spinal cord. So as that cerebral spinal fluid starts leaking out, your brain will rest on the base of your skull, and you'll get a nasty headache. Say, yeah. So what do they tell you to do? They tell you to lay flat for a couple hours, hoping that that hole will kind of seal. And if they don't, when, what do they have to do? Yeah, they do something. <laughs> they just tell you to go home. Hang on. And did you have an epidural? You know what they say to women who've had that bad, they like, I know exactly where it is, I can feel it. Right? I say that all the time. I just, just Did you have a, a poor epidural? My first one was bad. Did you have a leaky cerebral spinal fluid? I don't know, but I, it didn't work. Did you have a massive felt everything anyway? Well, you know you what, that's childbirth. Type? I do have a headache. They tell you that anyway, don't they? Just tell you, like, you might get a headache after. Yeah. That's probably what they're checking for, though. Yeah, but you, not always, should you? There's my Reader's Digest version of my web. I cannot see, man. While you're taking your test, too, I'm going to be doing this. Yeah, your final sister. What the hell is this? What is going on here? Where is all this? I'm in the announcements. Just relax. What? Oh, there it is. <laughs> like a magic show. What the hell is this? You know what? I'm going to stop recording and not worry about this stuff. Ah, uh, none of your beeswax over there. I'm educating. Here we go. Oops. like this one. This is what it's called a blood patch. So if you have a poor epidural and cerebral spinal fluid is leaking out, what they will do is draw about 20 cc's of blood. They will reinsert a spinal needle in there and they will inject your own blood into the epidural space. What does blood do that doesn't move? It clots, it clots and it forms a patch, a blood patch. Now, here's the sad thing about this. When you get this blood patch, that needle stays in there, along with the syringe. And people just are dying. They just go up there and just go, bing. Some doctors will hang their stethoscope right on it. So what they'll do is, when you start pushing the blood in, the doctor will push it in. it will keep asking, saying, is your headache gone? Is your headache gone? Is your headache gone? And as soon as that patch is good, 
then your headache will go away because you're constantly making cerebral spinal fluid. So once the hole is stopped, the headache should go away. Say, that's yeah. A that's a blood patch. Tell me, yeah. yeah. All right, who cares? Oh, that one's good. Didn't you like that? Oh, who cares? All right, here we go. <laughs> All right, watch. Know this. And we have another star today, Deborah Messing. <laughs> Doesn't that look like Deborah Messing a little bit? Yeah, a little bit. You can tell now that there's absolutely no creativity on uh, on public TV, you know, where they're, re they're recycling all these old shows. That's sick, man. Here we go. Ready? Is anyone paying attention? <laughs> All right, watch. I'm going to expri explain to you the production and circulation of cerebral spinal fluid. First of all, about 500 cc's of cerebral spinal fluid is made each day in an average adult. And on average, only 150 cc's is circulating around the brain and spinal cord. So what that means is, is that 350 cc's somehow has to get drained off from the brain and spinal cord. Say yes. So we'll enlarge Deborah Messing here. And I want to explain this. Let me explain to you where you are at. Look, the orange part right here, the little orange strip here, is a subarachnoid space, and that's where cerebral spinal fluid circulates. You got me? So here we go. You have the pia mater here, right, that covers the brain and spinal cord directly. Then you have the subarachnoid space. Say yes. And in the brain, you have the dura mater, and the dura mater actually folds on itself and forms a little pocket of blood, of venous blood. And this pocket of venous blood that goes around the brain and in through between the hemispheres of the brain is called the dural sinus. And the dural sinus is filled with venous blood. Are you with me? So, here we go. Within the ventricles of the brain are a complex of capillaries and cells called the choroid plexus. The choroid plexus filters the plasma of the blood to form cerebral spinal fluid. So what's plasma mostly made out of? Water, well, we learned. There you go. 0.9% sodium chloride, right? Normal saline, right? So what color should cerebral spinal fluid be? Clear. It should be clear, right? So when they do a spinal tap on somebody and they see that it's cloudy or bloody, that's never a good sign, right? So who's following this, guys? Huh? What are you running over? You know what that is? Oh, snow will be good. Snow. It's going to snow at 8 p.m. Right? My hem on my pants came down, so I used electrical tape to keep it up. <laughs> also, it was coming down, so I didn't have any tape, so I actually, where are they? I took staples and actually stapled them. <laughs> now watch. No one would have known that had I not told you. So who's laughing now? <laughs> the education of Gateway. And don't, you know what, look, don't give me that stuff. You got like a little bleed stain on your pants and it's blue. You know, you took a blue marker. <laughs> You've never done that, Vicki. All 
All right. Yeah, people telling stories over there. So I did this with my shoe. They were getting kind of jacked up. So I took, I was trying to electrical tape and it did work. It looked good. And then it started coming off. So if I would have glued it. <laughs> Joe, Chris, help me out, right? <laughs> I've had, I've had shirts that literally fell off me because the material just <laughs> rotted. They're your gamers, man. <laughs> Through college, I had a, a gray hoodie. I never washed that thing. And I wore that thing ever. It was just like that, was like a gray hoodie, right? And you know what? Like if I eat spaghetti or something, I just go like this. Now listen up. Now listen up. <laughs> but watch. Listen up because this is true. My buddy would call me up when we're in college. He goes, you want to go out? I'm like, yeah. So I would show up like that. He goes, you're going to go out like that. I said, yes. I said, you have not figured it out. I have. When you go out to a club, nobody's looking at you because they're worried about how they look. That's why how I dress and stuff, nobody cares. Nobody's looking at me, right? When I'm walking at home, nobody looks at me. I don't want them to, and if they do, I'll trip them. <laughs> do you understand? People don't get that. I figured that out at a very young age, and that's why I teach at a technical college. <laughs> Can I get through this? <laughs> Watch. You have the choroid plexus that filters arterial blood, filters the plasma of the blood, and forms cerebral spinal fluid. You have choroid plexi in the lateral third and fourth ventricle. Tell me you got that. We will start out in the lateral ventricles. As cerebral spinal fluid is circulating, producing the lateral ventricles, it will circulate through both lateral ventricles. The third ventricle is down here. There is a little hole called the intraventricular foramen, or the foramen of Moreau. And it's right here, and it will circulate that cerebral spinal fluid through the third ventricle. The third ventricle is connected to the fourth ventricle by the cerebral aqueduct. The cerebral aqueduct then sends the cerebral spinal fluid through the lateral aperture. The lateral aperture circulates cerebral spinal fluid around the cerebellum, or little brain. <laughs> that will then travel through the subarachnoid space around the spinal cord and as we learned in general there is a small hole through the middle of the spinal column called the central canal which cerebral spinal fluid circulates say so, yeah what's that showing pictures of dogs and I'm trying to educate Aww. you got me around the base of the spinal cord and then through the subarachnoid space, who's with me, up to the top of the brain. This is very important. Within the upper parts of the brain, you have little drains here called arachnoid villi or arachnoid granulations. Those are little drains that have like little valves on it and as the pressure of the cerebral spinal fluid builds up, it will open up these little valves and that excess cerebral spinal fluid is dumped into the dural sinus, which is filled with venous blood. That venous blood then drains into the internal and external jugular, then into the brachiocephalic vein, and then into the right atrium. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Tell me you followed that. Now watch. There are some people who are born with malformed or absent arachnoid villi. So they will produce cerebral spinal fluid, but it will not be adequately drained. And as you learned in general, when the kid pops out of the womb, boom, coming down the track there, 
the head's got to kind of just mold a little bit so it gets through the birthing canal. That's why some kids come out with a cone head or like a you know bozo looking head. So there, um, connected tissue connects the bones, the fontanelles of the skull. So because the fontanelles of the skull are not fixed, as that cerebral spinal fluid builds up, it will expand the skull, and they develop a condition called hydrocephalus. And usually at birth, if they develop hydrocephalus, it will also compress the brain tissue, which will cut off blood flow. That's why a lot of these kids are retarded, too. Tell me you got that. If the kid survives and decides to go to Gateway, then what they do is they put in what's called a ventricular shunt. It's a tube that goes into the lateral ventricles, and the tube lines the inside of the skull underneath the skin. And then that tube goes into the small intestines or the abdominal cavity to drain off that excess cerebral spinal fluid. It's called a ventricular shunt. Say, yeah. Make sense? Okay. So that's the circulation of cerebral spinal fluid. All right, now wait. Watch. You learn this in general. I, I, you know what, I take that back. We went over this in general. <laughs> okay, look, write this down. The true spinal cord, true spinal cord ends at L1, right? Then you have what's called the cauda equina, or horse's tail, right? And it actually digs down into the coccyx so that the spinal column's not flopping around inside the, or the spinal cord's not flopping around inside the spinal column, right? So it anchors at the base of the coccyx. So there's still nerves that come off of it, right? But not as many as the spinal cord. So when you do a spinal tap, you want to limit the potential damage to the true spinal cord. So that's why they do a puncture, a bumbar puncture, to get the cerebral spinal fluid below L1 because they know that the true spinal cord ends below L1. So they'll typically go between L3 and L4 to do a lumbar puncture to get a sample of cerebral spinal fluid. Say, yeah. Now, can I borrow this? Well, I'll use mine. Yes. <coughs> well, when they do a lumbar puncture, one of the things that they want to measure is they want to measure intracranial pressure, right? How much pressure is the cerebral spinal fluid actually producing? So if you have meningitis, that's going to cause inflammation of the lining, and that's going to increase intracranial pressure. So in addition to getting a sample of cerebral spinal fluid, they also want to measure intracranial pressure. So in emergency rooms, they will actually have beds that have a level on it, and they try to get the person as level as possible. So they'll lay them flat, and when they do the lumbar puncture here, they will put a manometer on there and measure the pressure of the cerebral spinal fluid. And by measuring the pressure here, because the person is level, or as level as can be, that will be an uh, indirect measurement of the amount of pressure that's in the brain, and they can determine whether their intracranial pressure is high or low. If you sit them up, then all the weight of and pressure of the cerebral spinal fluid is at the base, and you cannot get representation of the intracranial pressure in the brain. Make sense? There you have it. <coughs> okay, I killed that one, yeah? Alright. Okay. I'm going to give you a hint because I like you guys. As far as you know. Neurons of the central nervous system cannot divide. If you have brain damage, it don't get better. How many people here have brain damage? Okay, good. <laughs> How many people want brain damage? How many people suspect that this class will somehow <laughs> cause brain damage? All right, so if Neurons of the central nervous system can't divide. How do you get a brain tumor? See, that's why I put it up there. Thought you, you'd see that and then kind of, because it says cell types found in the nervous system. <laughs> Those ones. So watch, better write this down. Astrocytes are part of what's called the blood-brain.
are big, black, and beautiful. Bloodborne. Big, black, and pretty. On the final, if you write that, you will get extra credit. It's the blood brain barrier. Boy! <laughs> I know, I hate me too. You know what? You guys look like I feel. <laughs> Watch. Let me give you a. You ever see like a composite of all the people's looks? This is it. I get it. Watch. Is there bad stuff in the blood? Do you want everything that's in the blood to get into the central nervous system? No. Why? Because the central nervous system doesn't have a lymphatic system, so it can't fight off bad stuff. So you want to manage that environment very, very tightly. So astrocytes have like little suction cups that go on the capillary, and they will only allow certain things into the central nervous system. So it is part of the blood-brain barrier. This is why mental illness and the like, any type of central nervous system disorder, is very difficult to treat with drugs because you have to trick the blood-brain barrier into allowing those drugs into and through the blood-brain barrier. Tell me you got that. That's why a lot of these drugs have really nasty side effects because you really got to you know, concoct something that will fool that. Then you have these cells called oblyodendrocytes. They produce the myelin sheath in the central nervous system. So motor nerves are myelinated. Motor muscle, pop a lock, say yeah. And then you have glial cells. I added a broom and a must, uh, a, not a mustache, but a bow tie, because Glial cells kind of clean up the <laughs> environment within the central nervous system. So any cellular debris are handled by these glial cells. So I'm sure you've heard of a brain tumor called an astrocytoma mm -hmm. and a glioma. Those are the cells that are capable of dividing in and produce brain tumors. Then you have these ependymal cells. The ependymal cells, in conjunction with a capillary network, form the choroid plexus in the ventricles, and that's what ultimately produces cerebral spinal fluid. All right. So those are the uh, supporting cells within the central nervous system. Say, yeah. Now, write this down. In the peripheral nervous system, the myelin sheath of motor nerves is um, produced by cells called Schwann cells. Right? And Schwann cells are also those trucks that drive around and deliver meat <laughs> and fish to your house. Those, uh, uh, like turkey breasts, those things are good. Did you ever get Schwann turkey breasts? I'm going to bring you in a case. You know what's good too? Turkey jerky. You ever have it? I love it. Hey, can we take a break? Just five minutes, okay? Just five minutes, please. Okay. Go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, we're going to stay until I get this neuron thing done. Then you can go. <laughs> we had paper routes when we were kids. So we go collect them with each other. You know, that's when you had to pay the, the you had to knock on the paperwork, knock on the door, you had to pay for it, right? And he had this paper route where he had this apartment complex, right? And he goes, man, do you, well, don't pay their bills. <laughs> <laughs> their work boots would be outside, so we Wow, I turn my computer around, <laughs> his Facebook notice will come up. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> there, was this, there was this 
park and all. She called him Midnight Owl. <laughs> and he'd, <laughs> he'd get a buzz working, right? And he'd go, let's get in a fight. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. You know, and like I'm here to drink and try to pick up whip. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> so he starts picking on this guy, right? So they get in a fight. Then his buddy tries to jump in. So, of course, I got to jump in, right? And some of those fights, man, I mean, like beer bottles and stuff. I mean, it was crazy. Some you of know. those fights have been more than one. <laughs> <laughs> there was a lot of them. Look, I'm Irish, right? <laughs> Drink and we fight. Anyways, uh, <laughs> that particular night, <laughs> This guy, I push him away, right? And he goes, oh, you want some of this? And I go, yeah. And he goes, I ain't never lost a fight. And I go, well, I have. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. We were at a Jack in the Box in Yuma, Arizona. I'm not even playing. So we're sitting at a booth in the Jack in the Box. Just one second, and then I'm moving on. So I'm sitting here. My buddy Sag's sitting here. Danny's sitting there. I forget who the other guy was. He was a friend of his. Anyways, so there's this girl sitting over there. So Danny starts, like, eyeballing her, right? So... The guy gets up because he's with the guy, right? And he's like, you looking at my girl? And he goes, yes, so what? And he, like, pushes him, right? So Danny takes him, picks him up, and throws him through the window of a jack-in-the-box. And I'm like, we need to go. (laughs) I was always glad he was on my side. (laughs) Most days. (laughs) Okay, here we go. All right, back to the class. Oh, that was still recording. <laughs> I don't think you had, you, I don't think you recording, recording after break. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to have to <laughs> It's going to have to be edited. All right, so here we go. All right, ready? <clears throat> Okay, watch. Guys, this is the axon. So this would be the dendrite. Are you with me? Now, what's stored in the dendrite? Are the axon, the axon knob? Neurotransmitter, right? What's embedded in the dendrite? Neurotransmitter receptors. You got me? Mm -hmm. And they're specific. So when an electrical impulse, and I'll explain more, it travels down to the end of the axon, and the end of the axon is called the presynaptic membrane. So what would the dendrite be? I'm spitballing here. Oh, nice. That's called the postsynaptic membrane. Nice. Who said that? Dude, teach this class so I can go home. That's the postsynaptic membrane, right? And then neurons don't touch other neurons, and neurons don't touch cells. There's a uh, little space called the synaptic cleft. You got me? So watch. When the electrical impulse travels over the postsynaptic membrane, it is going to cause the release of the neurotransmitter through the process of exocytosis, and it's going to get dumped into the synaptic trough. That neurotransmitter is going to bind to that neurotransmitter receptor, and it is either going to cause that neuron to fire an electrical impulse or inhibit it from firing an electrical impulse. Do you follow this? Now, let's say it's excitatory, right? When this neurotransmitter binds there, it's going to cause an electrical impulse to be created in that neuron. Tell me you got that. Where does that 
electrical impulse begin in the axon hillock, right? And then the electrical impulse is transmitted down the axon of this neuron. Who, who's following me so far? Now, this is important. As long as that neurotransmitter is bound there, it will create an electrical impulse. Do you always want a nerve stimulated? No. no. So there's got to be some way to remove that neurotransmitter. You got me? So in the uh, synaptic cleft, there is an enzyme like a Pac-Man that will eat that enzyme off that neurotransmitter receptor. It's called monoamine oxidase. Are you with me? <clears throat> now, the other way that neurotransmitter receptors are removed is that neurotransmitter receptor is reuptaked it into the presynaptic membrane through a process of endocytosis. Are you following me? Now, in people with depression, the belief is, is that they don't release enough neurotransmitters. Are you following? So if you have less neurotransmitter, do you want the enzyme eating that off? No. So back in the 60s, they developed a drug called Nardil. And it was a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. It inhibited this enzyme from eating off that neurotransmitter. The problem with that is there was a lot of side effects associated with it. One of them was called tardive dyskinesia. Would they be like, so they weren't depressed anymore, but it wasn't good. So back in the late 70s and early 80s, they came up with selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors or selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. And basically what they would do is they would prevent the reuptakedness of these neurotransmitters. And more neurotransmitter would end up, end up in the synaptic cleft, and it would stimulate that nerve. Tell me you got that. And I don't want to get all metaphysical on you, but real quick, um, thoughts are things, right? It says in the Bible, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he, right? So if you are, if bad things happen to you, a series of events, bad things, it can actually alter your brain chemistry where you simply can't pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. So Depression, when people say I have a chemical imbalance, what they're really referring to is a lack of a specific neurotransmitter. So these selective norepinephrine reuptake and selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors have really changed people's lives. And here's the thing. People say, well, I don't want to be dependent on drugs. Watch. If you could live better through pharmacology, I say God bless you. Do you understand that? So there's no stigma associated with it. Back in the day, maybe, but not anymore. You, you wouldn't believe the people who are on these drugs. I mean, for real. Like, high-level, high-performing people are taking this, and they're feeling better. Is there anything wrong with that? No, but isn't there a way to yes. more neurotransmitters yes. so you don't have to rely on them? Yes. And uh, it's real simple. Read the textbook. <laughs> Um, here's the problem with that, is that <laughs> you can actually alter your brain chemistry through life events. If enough bad things happen to you, you can go into a state of depression where you simply can't pull yourself out of it. And you know this, right? You go to bed, right? You've got a lot of stuff on your mind, and your mind starts going in circle, right? I've got to do this, that, this, that. And then you become overwhelmed. Probably the most, uh, the thing that kills people the most in our society is stress and lack of sleep. Those are the two things that kill people, the quickest, right? And with these drugs, people are feeling better. They, you know, they can focus better, and they realize that, look, I mean, we all end up dead anyways. <laughs> that's what I look at. D did you follow that? Yep. So, I mean, that's really... Uh, pretty fundamental, pretty basic, all right? So what I want to do now, if you let me, is I want to explain to you. No, you won't let me? All right. And this is what I'll do. The 
heart is a pump. Did I tell you I'd give you extra credit if you made a video of you watching this and rocking back and forth and upload it to YouTube? Yeah, you can do that. I'll give you extra credit. Okay. Or what you could do is have one person doing it and you watching them do it in a video. Okay, hang on. Hmm. I feel nerve. Here we go. Here is the generation of an action potential in a nerve. Tell me you got that. And then it tells you, in the nerve, it tells you the effects of elevated calcium and uh, hyper and hypokalemia, hypo and hypocalcemia. Say yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. If you look at that, if you look at that, then uh, we're done for the day. You follow? Listen up. Then when we come in on Thursday, I'm going to explain to you how a motor nerve then stimulates skeletal muscle to contract. So, or Friday, whatever day you come back. You got me? Mm -hmm. Say yes. Okay. Um, I'll have to edit this tape. <laughs> What part was that? Like right after the flu. What was I talking about? Uh, or no, it was like an overview of the nervous system. Oh. Maybe we don't need that. No, you don't. Yeah, that's you general. Don't that. See ya. Okay. All right, guys. Come on, we got like, like, what, four classes left, right? Just make that final push. I'll try to make that final push, too. Don't hate. Appreciate it. What's that? Roller coaster. I didn't hear you. Say it again. Oh, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. No, I'm. I'm. Uh, I'm actually talking about me.